thank you for attending this uh, audio presentation, and uh, I'm uh, pleased to do this and delighted that you all can probably hear me. I would like to take you on a whirlwind journey that spanned about 98 years from 1908 till about 2005 when the cross-shaped building that housed the remaining Daughters of Wisdom was demolished. And all of 30 to 40 minutes, so hang on to your hats, folks. Here we go. This is a long chapter about St. Joseph's Convent. Quite complicated, okay, because there are a lot of influences at home and internationally, different circumstances and dimensions that have shaped the history of St. Joseph's Convent. So it's been an exciting research study and a challenge for me to summarize effectively in my allotted time. I'm going to paint a picture first about the people, the human side of the story, and then outline the framework of what I call the building that grew. So picture yourself in a time machine, zooming back about 114 years ago to October the 8th, 1908, 8 p.m. Look hard and you will see six sisters of the, create, uh, the congregation of the Daughters of Wisdom step off the train in Red Deer. Four sisters came directly from France and two from Ottawa, and they were in full regalia when they arrived. They came to create a school at the invitation of the visionary Father Henri Vaucon. He was the head of the missionary priests, the Pierre de Saint Marie de Tinchebray. The sisters stayed that first night in one of the best hotels in Red Deer, the Arlington. And that was probably the last day of comfort that they had for some time. They came for several reasons. The railway in 19, uh, 1891 was completed between Edmonton, Edmonton and Calgary, and the sisters the settlers came to the rich farmland of central Alberta. The traveling oblate missionaries couldn't keep up with the spiritual needs of the community. And Bishop Legal was rewarded when the Tinchebray priests came. There was some persecution of the uh, uh, priests in France as there was some separation between education and the church. But Father Vaucon was commissioned to buy land, to construct, oversee the construction of a church, and borrow not more than 30,000 francs. So I did some calculations, and at that time, a franc was worth about $4.50. And so it turned out to be about $135,000. He chose the North Hill site because of its commanding view, and he built a presbytery for the priest and a convent for the sisters. Father Rosson went back to France and convinced the superior general of the Filet de Sagris to come to Canada. That was the Daughters of Wisdom. And uh, Louis-Marie de Montfort founded the Daughters of Wisdom, and he chose the superioress of the congregation to be Marie Trichet. And there is a picture, I think, that you see of her. It's important, I think, to mention at this time that there was a, um, a difference between a congregation of nuns and an order of nuns. An order, uh, the, the group of nuns that were in an order took very solemn views with a strict separation of the ways of the world. And the congregation nuns took more lenient views, uh, vows, sorry. Um, the, the morning after the sisters arrived in Red Deer, two Democrats um, drove up to the hotel door. And I don't mean politicians for sure, but a Democrat is a beautiful horse-drawn carriage with large wheels and one or two seats in the front. The, the Democrats were driven 
my father Bossan and the then 15 year old Camille LaRouge. And um, they packed up the sisters and their baggage, drove through the town and up the steep hill to the convent site. The one sister described the the journey as the road was, there was no road up the hill, the country was too new, and it seemed like the Democrats might tip backwards. But at the top of the hill, the view was spectacular, ablaze with all the autumn colors and no suggestion of the rigors of winter to come. The convent was a 40 by 8, 48 foot building uh, in brick. Uh, the two bottom floors were nearly finished, but there was a great cleanup needed. So the sisters rolled up their sleeves and worked very hard to clean up the plaster t dust and the debris. And when they were finished, they had uh, their first mass said at the small um, chapel. And of course, winter did come, and the sisters from France were unaccustomed to the hardships that an Alberta winter can deliver. And the uh, the convent that uh, uh, contained the laundry and the kitchen was in one side of the building where Jack Frost was in total control. And not only that, but the water supply was at the bottom of the hill, 132 steps down. So they had to carry pail by pail up the hill. Many a foot slipped and water and pail went down the hill, just like Jack and Jill. And if that wasn't all, there was a peculiar taste to the water. And they had discovered that the convent dog had fallen into the well. And if that wasn't enough, a skunk fell in later. So who knew what contaminants were, were in that water? So they had water problems, they had heating problems, but they did have electricity, and that was a great boon to the community. The school was ecumenical and inclusive from the start. The first student that registered was Gwen Gover. Her family were Anglican people. They had just come from Britain and settled in Sylvan Lake. And then shortly after that, four Chinese students registered from age four to seven years old. The sisters tried really hard to present the greatest overview of education they could. The library had books in both French and English, and all the students did take French classes. And this was not a residential school. This was a boarding school, whereas students that lived outside of Red Deer were housed day and night at the school, and the students that lived in Red Deer could go home at night. Uh, Father uh, Fozan was quite insistent that there was an official authority that was governing the school system in Red Deer, and he petitioned for a school board so that the North Red Deer Separate School Number 17 was formed. And a Mr. A. Wyatt was the first chair. Father Wasson was, I think, believe, the treasurer. And Mr. Emile Hermery joined in 1912. And Mr. Camille LaRouge joined in 1917. And he actually served on that board of trustees for 31 years. That's remarkable. The name St. Joseph was chosen because the sisters were poor and they were in need of a guardian. And what better person than somebody being chosen by divine providence to look after Mary and her son, Jesus. The Aboriginal students joined probably in about the 1940s, and they came from the Cree, the Blood, and Blackfoot nations. Um, the, there is a, a statue, was a statue at the site at the time of St. Joseph. The school was a success from day one. And a year later, in 1909, there were 32 day students and 36 boarders. And the big thing that 
year was that a water well was dug on site. Who knows how long those pipes had to be to get to the water. So that all floors then had running water. There was great joy in the convent. The food was uh, 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 difficult to come by sometimes with that group of people, but the property was quite large. And so they were able to raise cows, pigs, and chickens on the property. So they did have eggs, they did have milk, and they did have meat. There was also large gardens grown and um, tended by the sisters. So they grew peas, beans, and corn, and so on. Berries were very abundant in the river valleys, so they had fruit and fruit for jams. It was a graceful landscape, and many artists uh, drew and painted uh, pictures of it. The convent was built close to the edge of the bank, and several times the bank caved in. There was a convent cemetery at the top, and a few times some of the bones did spill over the bank, and they were gathered up and re, re, reburied. The sisters in their in their habits were quite frightening to some of the students because of the box like uh, structure on their head, all in gray and white and a, and a large bustle at their back. Um, so the the nuns habit, the original one was developed in 1715, and it was used for about 250 years. And then the more um, modern habit in 16, in 1965, excuse me. And now the sisters wear very modern dress of skirts and blouses. So the sisters tried to provide as law, uh, as variety of perks for learning as they possibly could. And so the Parnassus Club was formed. And Parnassus comes from the Greek mythology, meaning mount or summit, so that the learning was as lofty as possible and they stretched in the talented students to higher learning. There were eight seats for literary, eight seats in all, and six for literary and two for artistics. So the students uh, did their writing and their compositions and they had lar many presentations and performances and did win many awards for their efforts. It was a Christian education in and out from day one. So the principles were tell the truth, live a good life and obey authority. But the routine was pretty monotonous at time and complained about by me, from many of the students. Awake at six o'clock, breakfast at seven, prayers at eight, classes, recess classes, and on and on. So that a fire a.m., a fire drill at 5 a.m. was a nice break. They, everybody did follow the laws of the church and none of the uh, students that were not of the Catholic faith were ever pressured to join the Catholic Church. There was a report time each Friday afternoon, and this was Mother Superior being uh, the authority in charge. Uh, the boys didn't like it very much because they were used, used to be the ones that had the most demeanors and they got rated on that. But they were judged on everything about their time at the convent. Religious studies, academic studies, decorum, cleanliness, respect, and on and on. And if you got a 10 in every category, it was called a max imam, which was considered a miracle. If you got a zero in any category, it was a disgrace. And you had to go to the Mother Superior's office for the love taps on each hand. Every male student served that was Catholic served on, on the altar. And perfect Latin and decorum was not only taught, but expected. There was an interesting story about the sacramental wine that was used at during Mass uh, for Communion for the Faithful, in that the wine was disappearing and being depleted faster than normal. Alberta was dry at that time, and to order the sacramental wine was on special order. 
Father Rousseau had been an altar boy in his youth, and he was pretty sure what was happening to the wine. So he had every boy take a solemn oath that alcohol would not pass their lips until they were 21 years old. But the wine still kept being uh, depleted, and so his success of the of the vow venture was left to discretion. The sisters were of a very compassionate and caring nature, although they did respect discipline. But because of this nature, there were about 15 girls that joined the novitiate after their schooling, and about three boys, I think two priests and one brother. I did a number of interviews and talks with people that were connected with the church. I talked with Mary Ruth McDougall, who was from the Blood Nation, and she attended St. Joseph's Convent uh, for grade 11 and 12, so she graduated there. She found that graduation was a, a very grand event with the girls in white gowns and mortarboards. She loved learning at that school, and she was a good learner, but needed more time sometimes to to learn the content. And so a uh, specific nun, Sister Searle, took a special interest in her and would take her aside and help her with her difficulties. She loved that sister. I talked with Marguerite LaRouge Watson, with Michael Don Levy, with Marie Hermery, with Sister Harriet Hermery, and Dino Truant, to name some. All had kind words about the convent meeting all their needs, very artistic, mental, and physical, and academic. There was sports, skating, hockey, and in the winter, volleyball, lots of uh, ball uh, groups for basketball, baseball, dodgeball, and sometimes the the boys' basketball, baseball team were allowed to invite the public boys' team to a competition. And invariably, um, Donnybrook broke out, and so the boys, the Catholic boys, were, were sanctioned that they couldn't invite the public school boys for a long time after that. Uh, they did a lot of chores in the, students did a lot of chores in the convent to, for the to contribute to the upkeep, and one of the chores was that heavy cloths would be uh, put under their feet and strapped to their uh, feet, and they skated on the hardwood floors until they shone like glass. So some of the routine was that a sister would rattle the doorknobs of the dormitories at 6 a.m., and then she peeked in, and the students were supposed to show a leg to indicate that they were awake. There was lots of grumbling and negative comments during that time because they didn't want to get up. Another sister monitored the bathroom parade so that the eldest student got to go to the use of facilities first. So it was a grand day when you became first on the pecking order. And as well, say, discipline was meted out accordingly, and sometimes that meant no dessert or sports and extra study. And um, if people, if students were disciplined, the news would travel quickly by Moxes Moxican telegraphed. And of course, the story was exaggerated unbearably until sometimes the offense sounded like it came from the darkest, darkest corners of hell. The girls outnumbered the boys by quite a bit, so a fence was built between the two recess uh, playgrounds. And some of the boys had crushes on one or more of the girls, so many notes or trinkets were passed through that fence. The boys were not allowed to wear patent leather shoes either, so just in case they were talking quite closely with a, a girl, uh, uh, unimaginables could be reflected in their shoes. Finances were always tough. Uh, for the sisters, and if the crops failed and parents could not supply the fees for their students or the school board couldn't pay for their rent, um, the resilient sisters often gave music lessons and 
sewing lessons. Sometimes their their efforts were rewarded by it. They received two pianos and a violin. Um, and then taxes were allocated, the property taxes were allocated by the government so that if you declared your religion, the taxes went to the schools. Now, there was many, many people that had outs that led outstanding lives after they were students at St. Mary's, or at St. Joseph's Convent. Um, one particular person that I identified was Doug Cardinal. He was from the Algonquin and Blackfoot Nation, and he could be considered the most polarizing architect of all time. He had a passion for art, and this was called cultivated at the convent, which influenced him greatly. And in 1968, he built the iconic St. Mary's Church. This church was said to have launched him into the architectural stratosphere of, um, of architect, or architecture. Uh, there were, he built 35 famous buildings from the Museum of Civilization and History to the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. And he built many other famous buildings throughout Canada, United States, and Italy, received 34 awards from as far away as Bulgaria, Russia, and the UK. I identified the Truant family as another uh, group, or uh, two people at least anyway, that had been students there, Alfio and Dino, and they received a great deal of their schooling at St. Joe's. Dino told me he liked the sports that, that, were, that they had advantage of participating in, and he learned how to wood burn, which he liked to do. Dino said that the nuns kept a sharp eye at recess, so no interaction between girls and boys happened just in case the girls would tell the boys something that they should not know. Um, they worked at their father's Red Deer Bottling while at school. Red Deer Bottling actually started in 1911, but the Truant family bought it in 1934. And now a third generation of Truant management exists. There's no bottling now, but it's a distribution site. The, the, the business op, uh, occupies 20, over 24,000 square feet and is situated in the Edgar Industrial Park. Red Deer Bottling and the Truett family have been responsible for many economic benefits to the community. They belong to many service organizations and were donors and sponsors for many community events. So they really did community participate a lot in the Red Deer community. Now I'm going to take you through uh, the building part of the convent site, which provides a framework actually, or at least a physical framework um, for the building. And of course in 1908, the first structure was built and you have a picture there, I believe. Uh, in uh, 1911, when the water well was dug on site, it was also a year that there was an epidemic at, of infantile, infantile paralysis, which is polio. And the boarders were sent home at that time. The sick were cared for at the convent. And unfortunately and tragically, Mur Muriel Harcourt, seven years old, died at that time. In 1910, a small cottage had been built for isolation. It's not uh, clear whether that was used for the polio epidemic, but it was certainly used later on when the Spanish influenza was present. In 1912, and you'll see a picture of the uh, building that Alexander Turnbull, he was the architect, uh, hired for that purpose, and he constructed uh, the west wing onto the original building that contained a dining room, classroom, and three classrooms on the second floor. And he also built, to the surprise of the sisters, a beautiful wooden altar that uh, was greatly received and appreciate, appreciated by the sisters. In 1917, there were 75 boarders. And that was at the time of World War One, 
when many mothers returned to work and put their children in boarding school. And a year later, the Spanish influenza attacked the convent. The school was closed for two weeks. The cottage used the isolation quarters, and fortunately, everyone recovered. In 1922, there was also an addition to the original building, and that was added on the north side. It was known as the gallery, and that was able to house performances and concerts. In 1924, the Tinchabray priests left. Father McDonald came in charge, and a grotto was built from the stones of the abandoned church basement. And Mr. Emil Hermery built that grotto. Uh, the sisters planted bushes and trees uh, beside it. As statue was donated by one of the sisters, and it was used for the processions, the religious processions, one of them being Corpus Christi. In 1925, the Apostolic School was purchased for $700 for back taxes. This became a dorm for boys and a classroom renamed, it was renamed Mount Fruit School. And the building, Montfort School, has actually doubled in size in 1928. In 1925, Sacred Heart Church was built on 55th Street, where it is today. And the parishioners were so happy because they didn't have to climb that steep hill. And, you know, honestly, when I was reviewing these dates and buildings and whatnot, it makes your head dizzy. So another addition was made in 1928. This was the three-story addition, which is a lovely uh, building that it, it ended up being. Um, and um, in 1928 also, Sister Hyacinth undertook extensive um, upgrades to the older part of the building where the plaster floors and the electrical were all replaced. In 19, there was always in need of more space because the enrollment kept enlarging. In 1948, still more room was needed, and the army camp near the um, memorial site was vacated, and the sisters were able to buy one long hut that was purchased and, you, and moved to the convent site, used for drama, graduation, exercises, and a lunchroom for the day students. That hut was removed in 1964. And onwards we go to 1950 when there was 250 students. The board purchased the YMCA building, which is across was across from the Memorial Center, and renamed it Sacred Heart School. And then five years later, a new four-room Sacred Heart School was built on that site. And going back a couple of years to 1953, a new Mountford School was built across the street from the convent. And in 55, classes from the convent was moved to the Mountford School. And in that year, the convent authorities decided that boys over 14 years old were not allowed to be boarders because there was a feared an awakening of the boys at that time as they reached puberty and they termed it vive la difference which means long live the difference of the generation so i thought that was a an odd um, description in 1958 the junior and senior high schools and seven teaching sisters were bused to the rented army hut space, which had then been named River Glen School. And hot lunches were sent each day from the convent for the students and the sisters. And in 1959-60, all classrooms were closed at the convent, but the girls could still be boarders for another two years. So in 62, all border spaces were closed. With school busing, the students could live at home. And also at that time, St. Joseph's Junior and Senior High School opened so that there was more classrooms and schools available. 
In 1981, Mountford School was closed, was renovated for the Red Deer Catholic Regional Division Number 39 offices, and it's still there today. And the school system, Catholic school system now has 10,000 students in 13 Red Deer schools and seven regional schools. In 1976, the convent and the grotto was demolished, but the, stu- the sisters were still in Red Deer, and a new residence for the sisters was finished in 78. It was a cross-shaped building that stood on the site, and they lived there until 2005 when the last sisters left. So that's the, the framework of the of the uh, the building that grew. And in conclusion, I just want to say that the North Hill Conman site, this graceful landscape was guarded, guarded the town of Red, City of Red Deer and the Red Deer Valley for 60 years and witnessed many changes since 1908. Sister Harriet Hermery was heard to say, wow, what did our founders start? I'm very impressed. The school system has grown beyond expectations, and I think they have done an excellent job in forming Christians. In 2005, the land was rezoned and sold a room for a condominium complex known as the Views at St. Joseph. It's a four-story, 55-unit, looking building that opened in 2009. A replica of the original convent dome sits proudly on the on the top, forever guarding the convent hill. The original refurbished dome is seated in the gardens at the views for all to see. And if you're seeing an uh, artistic view of the convent, that was done by Meredith Evans in 1977. I believe it was pen and ink. Many schools have been built over the years by the Catholic system. One school in particular that has a connection with St. Joseph's Convent is Camille J. LaRouge High School, built in 68 and honoring Mr. Camille LaRouge. The school was renamed in 96 the Ecole Camille J. LaRouge and became a French immersion kindergarten to grade nine school. The school appropriately recognized Mr. LaRouge, who came from France in 1907, spoke several languages, of course, as well as French, and was deeply involved in the community and the church life. He was on councils and trustees and Knights of Columbus and credit unions and so on. All of the children of Mr. and Mrs. LaRouge attended St. Joseph's. Marguerite, Elaine, Cecilia, Camille Jr., and Robert. And Marguerite's daughter, Anne-Marie Watson, is now following in his, her grandfather's footsteps and has already served 10 years on the Red Deer Catholic Regional Division Board. History is now repeating itself. And Mr. William Don Levy, who wrote extensively about the convent, in his reflection said that although they sometimes complain bitterly about the regimentation and monotony of the daily routine, he he retained the utmost praise and fond memories of the priests and sisters who dedicated their lives and left an indelible imprint on the lives of students of St. Joseph's Convent. Convent. And evidence of this uh, is apparent, apparent in that they had a 50, 70, and 100-year reunion where many alumni returned and recounted the good old days of the convent. So no institution or group of teachers provided a greater influence on the young lives of students as the Daughters of Wisdom at St. Joseph's Convent. For 70 years, St. Joseph's Convent was a witness to a number of conversions to the Christian faith where young men and women, women joined the service of God. The bricks and mortar of St. Joseph's Convent are now gone but the memory of these days will live forever in the hearts and souls of the hundreds of students, families, and history, and sisters, pardon me. The philosophy and the discipline of the convent teachers will continue in their students for years to come. 
thank you for your attention and to Mark Collins who helped with posting the pictures. Thank you.